I'm going to talk about the future of ops jobs. My name is Charity Majors. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Honeycomb.io, a co-author of Database Reliability Engineering and Observability Engineering. Um, the Observability book is fairly newly out, and if you want a free copy, honestly, we post the link on the Honeycomb Twitter feed all the time, so download it. Um, what you might want to know about me is that I identify as an operations engineer. I have been doing infrastructure, ops, SRE, you know, my entire career. I've been, I used to say I've been on call since I was 17. I care a lot about operating software effectively and efficiently. I feel like that, that is what's interesting about software. That is what's hard. Production is where the hard problems sit. It's where the users sit. It's where things get real. Honestly, you can, <laughs> you can round the cost of building software down to zero compared to the cost of running and maintaining it over the life cycle of your code. Um, if you're writing software and isn't in production yet, it may as well not even exist. So I'm pretty adamant on that point. Um, how many of you have seen this pop up in your Twitter feed? Well, I can't see anyone waving hands, but uh, yeah, me too. Uh, which is basically why I was baited into writing this talk. This kind of bullshit uh, is what gives marketing a bad name. Um, software doesn't die. <laughs> Methodologies don't die. Uh, you know, uh, teams having empathy for each other doesn't die. Software does I mean, to prove that software doesn't die, like here is a very long list of prep that is not dead, all of which is extremely older than DevOps. Um, saying that DevOps is dead is just kind of stupid. Uh, it's it's clickbait marketing at its worst, worst and I, I find it incredibly annoying. But the reason it got so much attention is because there is a little tiny kernel of reality underneath which is that um, the need for DevOps is not eternal. And what I mean by that is, well, consider like the long arc of software careers from, you know, 1980s or whatever until the current day. Well, we started out with engineers who wrote their code and ran it in production. And this involved, you know, <laughs> telnetting into servers and and like editing the code in Vim live, right? Hitting save and, you know, if you were lucky, maybe you committed it somewhere. But it was, you know, you didn't have ops and devs. You, you just had people who dealt with software. Uh, stuff got complicated and, you know, we kind of spun off into these, into these teams, these famous silos, right? Where the devs write the code, they lob it over the famous wall, ops runs the code. This doesn't work very well for anyone. Friction ensues. People get mad. Some of us go on to write, uh, comics about the bastard operator from hell, right? Not good. So 2007, 2006, 7, 8 ish DevOps emerges where they're like, hey, all right, uh, the, the, lay, the lamb and the lion must lay down. They must be friends, hug ops. You know, we have empathy for each other. But now I feel like for the past, you know, five or so years, I think that we've been trying to figure out how to reunify the streams, how to bring back together um, the writing of the software and the running of the code. Um, to help engineers own their own code in production. And I think increasingly, you know, we're, we're putting software engineers on call for their code. We're spinning down ops teams. And, and these days, I think, you know, every engineer, this is, this is the expectation on a healthy team, right? Every engineer writes code and every engineer runs the code that they write. They're responsible for their software in production. Um, this is a good thing. Um, I think I think that you know what is it that we all want out of our of, out of our work according to Dan Pink it's autonomy, mastery, and meaning. If you're writing your software up in you know some ivory tower, it doesn't really have much meaning. It doesn't have any meaning until your users are using it, right? Ops production is where is where code meets reality. Um, and so why is this happening now? Well, I think it's because the shape of the complexity uh, that we're dealing with is is changing. It used to be there was a lot of surface area, uh, and but like systems are become, well, hold that thought, <laughs> I'll get to it in a second. 
systems are becoming rapidly more complex, like exponentially more complex. Um, and because of that, they can only really be operated well by people who write them. And the flip side is also true. You really can't do a good job of writing them unless you're regularly exposed to the feedback loops of operating them, the way that they fail, the error cases, the way they behave. If you're an engineer who only looks at your system when, when it goes down or when there are problems, you're not a good engineer because you don't know what good feels like. In order to know what bad feels like, you need to train your gut on what good feels like. Systems, you know, it used to be that ops could kind of like treat them like black boxes, you know, set up monitoring checks and stuff. But increasingly, you really have to introspect the systems themselves. You have to be comfortable changing code. You have to be comfortable, um, you know, operating it. it. It really goes back both ways. But like, does this mean that operational skills are obsolete and that people who are expert in running systems uh, can retire now? Uh, I wish. <laughs> Uh, actually, operational expertise is both more difficult than ever and it's more important than ever. Uh, what is true is that the landscape is shifting. Your skills are not obsolete, but the job titles are different and the expectations are different, mostly because the level of abstraction where engineers get to operate is getting much higher. Like my ops team works for AWS. I started out in ops teams that were racking and stacking servers and, you know, we had screwdrivers and when the RAM failed, we'd take it out and we'd fix them, you know? Um, I, when I got paged in the middle of the night that the database primary was down, I would call a taxi. <laughs> get in the car, go down to the colo, plug that, plug that thing in or, or like hook up the crash card or whatever. Uh, but like we're all moving up the stack in one way or another. We've moved way up the stack from, from racking and stacking servers, um, which is great. Um, but like two really big trends are kind of converging here. The one that I just mentioned where everybody writes code and runs the code they write. And the, and this, and the second one where the level of abstraction is, is, is growing and software is becoming much more reliable. I, it goes against my grain to even say those words. Uh, but it is true. We can take for granted, you know, when was the last time you had to debug, you know, a kernel stack trace in your code? Probably not very often. And that used to be a very commonplace thing. Right now, like if you're using, you know, a stable, um, you know, branch, a stable of, of Ubuntu or of Debian or whatever, you can pretty much assume that if you're running normal workloads, you're not, and you don't have millions of, of nodes, you can take the operating system for granted. You can take the web server for granted. This is phenomenal. Um, we can take so much software for granted. We can all move up the stack. This makes us incredibly productive. You know, back in the days when we had to go deep on backend stuff, you couldn't spin up uh, an app with just a couple people, right? You had to hire armies of engineers. Uh, Instagram was famously built with eight people, right? sold for to Facebook for a billion dollars, eight people, not even eight engineers. It was eight human beings, although they were mostly engineers. Anyway, if you love operational work, um, first of all, I salute you. <laughs> we have a similar pathology. But secondly, like you increasingly you're coming to a fork in the road and your career choices will take one of two paths. If you love infrastructure, then you should go use your skills to solve a category problem for the world, whether that's, you know, paging alerts at pager duty or, you know, observability companies or whatever. If you deeply love working on infrastructure software, um, then you should probably go work on a pass or infrastructure as a service or, or just a really good tool that, that can kind of sweep the landscape. Because again, you know, the world doesn't need a kajillion engineers who know how to configure DNS and bind. We're going to have a couple of really good um, name server companies and the rest of us just get to pay them a small amount, pay them a small amount of money for them to do what they do. All right. So if you love infrastructure, go build infrastructure solve a category. But if you really love operating code, uh, this is where I think it gets interesting because um, the the skills that you have developed in, for running software and, and building infrastructure can, can be used mostly to help other companies run as little infrastructure as possible. Uh, 
um, to focus as many of their their core engineering cycles on their core business problems as possible. Software engin- engineering cycles are the scarcest resource in every every universe. It's 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 harder to come by and and scarcer than money. Even now that we're not in a zero interest rate phenomenon. <laughs> Uh, if you love operating code, then basically you you kind of have two options. You can either work as an SRE or DevOps or someone who specializes in you know um, it's almost like you're a consultant, right? You're helping software engineer. Software engineers are owning their code in production, and you're helping them. You're helping them do it well. You're building like reusable components, whatever. And and secondly, platform engineering I think has kind of emerged from this whole reshuffling realignment. And and I want to talk about that super briefly. Um, Companies are are shutting down or looking for ways to shut down their ops teams, traditional ops teams that don't write code left and right, right? As they should. Uh, And outsourcing infrastructure to companies that can do it better than they could if they tried to do it all themselves. Um, But that means that we all now rely on a very complicated web of other providers, services, tools, be it APIs and SDKs, just look at how many companies go offline whenever US East uh, goes down. Um, and this has led to the to the development of these platform teams where, you know, software skills and op skills, I think, are equally important for a good platform team. But th- does this mean that um, platform teams are ops teams? No, it does not. In fact, I have a handy dandy little test for you uh, to be able to see if your platform engineering team is really a platform team or not. This is the question. Is the team responsible for SLOs, service uptime, reliable customer experience? If no, congratulations, you have a platform team. If yes, you do not have a platform team. You have some kind of ops or or service or um, SRE team. Because the real core difference here is that platform teams build for developer product productivity. Platform teams succeed when developers could easily choose good defaults, self-serve their infra, and own their own code in production. Platform teams are not responsible for building lots of software. Uh, they can't be. They'll get bogged down on it. Platforms are the, are the ultimate glue team. So like, which metrics does your platform team care about? SLOs, errors, service availability, et cetera, or time to spin up a new service or database or run a migration or do some other developer workflow. That's really what separates the the, the teams. Um, and if your platform team spends a lot of time writing software, honestly, something is wrong. They they shouldn't have a lot of code to own. They're, they're not a product team. They're a glue team. Platform teams kind of uniquely sit between these two tectonic plates, infrastructure code and business code, each moving at very different speeds. Infra code moves at the speed of, um, you know, Debian upgrades and software releases. Business code changes several times a day. Uh, lots of small disks um, shipped frequently. Um, this is part of letting engineers abstract infrastructure away. Um, <laughs> run less software. A huge part of any platform team's remit is what I think of as vendor engineering. It's choosing and evaluating vendors, writing libraries, helpers, providing a consistent user interface to engineers so they get lots of goodies for free. Platform is an incredibly high leverage team. Um, and uh, one of the best ways you can leverage your expertise, of course, is to help companies not run infrastructure. It's harder than you think. Um, cost is an essential part of architecture. I think this is something we kind of lost sight of over the past few years. Um, one of the best ways that you can um, get ahead of the curve and be a super valuable senior contributor is is really just to uh, um, learn to think and talk about the value of your work and translate it into the universal language of business goals and dollars. <laughs> Um, and for infrastructure engineers, we really, really, really have to learn to be a, a product team, to work to, to work with product folks and um, talk with users, do user research, even work with designers. Um, but don't lose heart. We're still ops <laughs> deep down. Um, uh, <laughs> the hardest part of, of software is, is, is operating it. Always has been 
always will be. Got another meme here. Wait, platform engineering is just ops? Boom. No. Wrong. In conclusion, we are still ops engineers at heart, which means that what we really bring to teams is, is the reassurance that computers are terrible. Everything fails. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Everything dies. So have fun.